and kick off the March meeting of our Master Gardener Foundation with a quick reminder that next week, next week spring is coming at 8.06 p.m. right here, you know, so we know exactly when it's going to be. So it, uh, so it's it's a coming. And of course, this is, I always like this, this the um, uh, the slide here because, you know, we always think, of course, that the, these equinoxes are equal, equal um, day and equal night, um, but only if we're living on the equator. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but the, but the good news is things are, we are getting, you know, a lot of light now, you know, and so let's, let's, let's have those little plants growing. Okay. A lot going on today. So it's uh, a lot of announcements, a lot of updates, lots of things happening on Bob Simmons is going to join us here today. And it, uh, um, this was actually inspired, um, Aaron, by your podcast with Val talking about rain gardens which led me to do a little digging into a, okay, you know, is it, you know, how do we deal with, you know, you know, with, with, you know, the bigger scope of, you know, dealing with all this water. And yes, we've had a lot of water this, this rain season. So Bob Simmons is going to talk to us about a WSU initiative to deal with stormwater specifically in rural, uh, in rural environments. And I had, we had no idea that this was led. So I, but I want to give you Aaron credit for you, you, this is, you dropped the breadcrumbs, right? That led to this right here. So more on this. Hey, lots of birthdays uh, this month, Jude, you know, and at, uh, you know, Patty Wilson, Shar, you know, happy birthday, Katie birthday. So it's a, it's a busy, busy March uh, birthday. And Kathleen, of course, is it uh, just bringing up the, bringing up the rear of the, of the month. Happy birthday to all. Okay. Reminder of our board meeting tonight, tonight at 5.30 p.m., 5.30 p.m. Uh, the URL and at, uh, the meeting information is in the, it, uh, is in the e-news. This uh, is, is also uh, printed here. Study group is next Monday, next Monday at 1 p.m., 1, 1 p.m. And at, uh, Jude will be talking about that when we get up to a uh, Tapio moment right now. Because one of the things that uh, Jude, I got uh, thinking about is, of course, we know that you're that the, the theme is going to be lichen uh, for the study group. But I was also doing pruning this uh, weekend and realized and, and, you know, saw amazed by how much lichen was on the old, slow growing branches that I was cutting off. And it uh, did a little digging here in terms of the because uh, this is it's a question that often comes up when we're giving uh, uh, pruning clinics. You know, is it, uh, what about the lichen? You know, do I need to clear the lichen off the plants? And of course, as we know, you know, the lichen is not, you know, harming the, it's not parasitic to the plant. And it, um, you know, but there are opportunities to uh, to improve airflow and it uh, to uh, ensure that the um, the lichen is minimized. But, and but- Did uh, you find out that there was any danger to them at all? No, no, there's not this, you know, it, uh, that's that's not what the uh, that's not what our our research based uh, information is telling no, us. No, there no there is not. Except I did live in an area that had a lot of ice storms, and there was some conjecture that perhaps the lichens caught so much of the water that their weight did increase tremendously. But again, this, the the final conclusion was no. If those trees had been really healthy before the ice storm those branches wouldn't have broken. So that's, that's the only thing that seems to indicate it at all. But I hope a lot of you will join us on our study group. Um, I think Kelly's going to be the technician, right, Kelly? I'm, I'm gonna, it's going to be a busy Monday, but I, I will, I will, I pledge <laughs> to be there. Try, huh? Yeah, I, I think they're fascinating. I have tried my best to forget most of what I know about lichens and just enjoy their beauty because I think they are really beautiful. But a long time ago, I was tremendously interested in them and their composition. When I was a grad student, I thought, I wonder if you can take these things apart into their two components, or now we know three or four maybe, but into the two components of fungus and algae, and then put them back together again. What a fantastic thing that would be. I could find nothing in the in the literature about it so I tried and I did take them apart, but I could never get them back together again. As a matter of fact, I couldn't even keep the fungus alive. I could keep the algae, um, actually it was a cyanobacteria. I could keep it alive in culture, but I could not keep the fungus alive. So of course I couldn't get it back together. 
but um, I'm through taking things apart. I just want to enjoy how they look today. But so you I proved, but you, but you proved they were truly a symbiotic, uh, a symbiotic creature, right? That they they need both to be to be alive to uh, to function. It seems that the L, the cyanobacteria and the algae, the ones that do the photosynthesis, can survive on their own, but that the fungus in none of them that they've tested can live on its own. So it is obligate, definitely. It's it's got to have that that photosynthetic organism with it, or it will die. That is fascinating. That truly is fascinating. And of course, we have so much lichen here in the Northwest. I mean, this yeah. is going to be it's going to be a great study group. It it's it's really great. And and by the way, if you're out taking pictures in the forest of all those things that hang down, be aware that not all of them are lichens, but take their picture anyway, and we'll talk about what they are. Okay. I hope I'll see you. Quick reminder then of our new website and if it um, and activities in terms of where you need to be reporting, uh, you know, at, uh, to a give pulse as well as to where the all the information is relative to our foundation. So at, uh, on the on the um, on the home page, right? You know, um, you know, on that home page, pnwmg.org, that will redirect you to this longer URL you'll see the MGV, the Master Gardener Volunteer tab. And that um, that button will take you to the volunteer portal um, where all of our all of our official resources are stored. Okay. And then reminder then uh, that Give Pulse is also accessible directly from that uh, that home page. So you've got a button there that takes you directly to our Give Pulse, um, uh, our, our Give Pulse site. So again, as we say every uh, month, remind everybody that, that um, you know we are meeting here today as members, as Master Gardener members of our foundation of Grace Harbor and Pacific Counties, and it, um, uh, this information is on um, our public websites, mm -hmm. indicating that we as a foundation, right, are 100% volunteers, and we provide 100% of the financial support for our Master Gardener program here in our two county areas. The program, of course, is administered by WSU, you know, and we focus on public education with research-based information. And it, um, indeed, that's why we gather. And as a corporation, as a nonprofit corporation, the state of Washington, we actually do have a functioning board and operate uh, according to bylaws and with a charter. Um, Elizabeth is our president. Mike is our president-elect. A, 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 a flanks of, of, um, of, of, of directors uh, supporting, uh, supporting the program and the supporting the programs throughout the year. We are supported by regional directors in Pacific County, Greater Grays Harbor and Coastal Grays Harbor. And Coastal Grays Harbor. So Renee, Valerie and Sushila lead those subgroups given the fact that our two county geography spans 3,500 square miles. So this is at, um, pretty unique across at, um, across all the Master Gardener Foundations here in the in the uh, in, in the state of Washington, given the size of uh, geography that we have to manage. We welcome Wendy along with Alina as our two coordinators, and it uh, you know and so this is at um, this is at as as announced in the in the e news this uh, you know this week. Um, you know, at, uh, we, um, you know, uh, Brenda is still is, is remaining as a volunteer, but is stepping back from a coordinator responsibilities. And Alina is now joined by Wendy. So we're back up to two coordinators. Um, and at, um, we're still waiting on uh, feedback from WSU in terms of our faculty liaison. Okay. Can I make another comment, please? This please. is Elena. Please. Um, I am still stepping down as program coordinator at the end of the year, so Wendy will need someone to be working with her. So we're still looking for another person who is would volunteer to be a program coordinator this year so that I can help that person also as I'm helping Wendy now to learn um, the role of program coordinator. It's not gonna be fair to Wendy if no one steps up. It's not a job that anyone wants to do by themselves. There you so go. Please, yeah. please step up now so that you can get the support and training 
that Wendy is getting right now. I'll remember to add to a slide uh, to a slide here, Alina, that, uh, you know, we're still looking for looking for number three, our, you know, our, our coordinator in waiting. Yes. Thank but you. Thank you, Wendy, for stepping up. This it's it's going to be fun working with you. OK. OK, so we have um, lots of things going on. I want to, uh, you know, I'm going to jump into the March to do's and we'll get into a number of announcements as we proceed, uh, proceed further. Our March to do's again coming from um, Oregon State speak specifically speak specifically to this is the time we actually can put you know vegetables out there for our cool season crops as long as we've got the soil consistently above 40 degrees. And this is again another plug here for WSU's Ag WeatherNet. Um, they've changed the interface, by the way, to WSU Ag WeatherNet. Requires you to log in. It's a free login, but I encourage everybody to have this bookmarked and to uh, to and to register because uh, that uh, it's a pretty cool website with tons of information across the entire state here. And it um, so here are the soil temperatures for the last seven days. And guess what? They are all consistently above forty degrees. This is actually a, a change from uh, March of last year, by the way. And I found that interesting that um, in terms of looking at um, uh, last year's uh, the, um, uh, 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 presentation, we are actually are warmer significantly than we were last year at this time. So we're certainly not in a balmy 50s or 60s, but I hear tell that this weekend is definitely going to be in the upper 60s. And at uh, Seattle, the Puget Sound may actually, it, uh, it may actually touch a 70. So it's time to thinking about getting stuff outside. Now, rainfall, a lot more than last year. This is significant. I mean, if you look at here at the averages over that uh, the rain year that begins in October for us here in the Northwest, the rain year begins in October. And you look at the average versus what we have now. And it's, uh, it's fascinating that Grayland of all places is actually below the average, while every other site we're talking about here is significantly over. And I think everyone that uh, this is as uh, only as of March, uh, March 10th, I think if you add the next last couple of days of rain on top of it, it would be it, uh, it'll even be further. So this is a it's the big deal. Again, it's a plug for the uh, a plug for the weather, uh, the ag weather net site. And it because um, uh, lots of information, as you can see off to the left in terms of all the headers, that uh, WSU offers for this uh, for this weather site. Okay, other March to dos. Well, OSU is starting to think about cutting grass, you know, and getting the blade height set high enough. A reminder here is that after you do cut the grass, don't compost it if you're using a weed and feed products or herbicides. Um, they talk about uh, composting and fertilizing, but only if needed, and then pruning the spring flowering shrubs after the blossoms fade. Basic information, of course, but still, um, you know, but, it, uh, but it's a good reminder uh, for us to be at, uh, paying attention to. This is also the time to be thinking about propagation and planting of, um, of plants that are gonna be at, um, that, are gonna, that we, you'd like to have in full bloom come in April and May when we need that pollination going on. So at, uh, OSU refers us here to two, uh, very helpful and, uh, you know, at, uh, uh, references here, propagation of plants by grafting and two, encouraging beneficial insects. Okay. And again, I want to give a plug to this, um, this propagation of plants by grafting and budding. Um, I've actually tried to get this uh, Dr. Kumar to come speak with us here because uh, uh, I think it'd be a very interesting discussion. I think is we all should be doing more of this interesting, that, um, uh, interesting propagation method. Okay, and then finally, under pest monitoring, you know, it um, you know is an encouragement here to think IPM. Uh, to, uh, when we start thinking about all the pests that are going to be coming, just now, you know, not just now, uh, but later at um, but later on. And it um, interesting comment, interesting bullet here. They talk about um, making sure that we're um, we're paying attention to predatory insects that are helpful to keeping aphids and other pests under control. It's a reminder that ninety percent of all insects are beneficial. And yet, um, you know, that uh, the typical um, public view of insects is that uh, let's um, let's kill them all. 
So it, uh, you know, it's just it's uh, it's it's very thoughtful from a uh, master gardener perspective to be it uh, to be very conscious about um, uh, about um, about the helpful insects that truly are um, part of our landscape and part of our gardens. Okay. Hey, Kelly, can I interject for just a second? Please, Aaron. Um, IPM. The next episode of the Evergreen Thumb is IPM in the Vegetable Garden um, with Laurel Moulton from Clallam County, and she's on the state IPM team for WSU. So um, we're going. We had a really good conversation deep into IPM in the Vegetable Garden and insectary plants and things like that too. So. An excellent plug for the podcast. Now, mind you, just put into the chat, Aaron. Go ahead and put in the chat once again, right? The URL for this thing, so that we're all we're all staying and paying attention to this thing. Reminder that Aaron is leading this for the entire state, so it's a you know we definitely are punching above our weight as a foundation at the state level. Okay. Final set of, uh, of it, uh, uh, March to do's here is to think about taking um, our, um, you know, uh, plants that we may have had inside and bringing them out. Um, I myself, um, we lost a couple of fuchsias that I kept outside during some of the hard freezes we had. So it, um, there's, it, um, you know, I, I you know, should have taken better care even here at the coast of my outdoor plants, given the severe cold that we did experience over this past month. Um, and that, um, and you can see here that OSU is recommending next month to move a lot of uh, plants outdoors, um, but they're still holding back in terms of saying it, um, in terms of in terms of uh, talking about plants coming out. Reminder, of course, about soil testing. Um, the OSU guide is actually that is pictured here to the right is actually a much better guide for uh, for home uh, home gardens in terms of the references for the labs. Uh, for soil test. Uh, but WSU has a great website talking about how to collect soil samples and uh, soil sampling. Um, we're going to be talking about the, the training, the 2024 intern training in a couple slides here, but a reminder that, um, uh, that this Saturday is on soils. And guess what? James Cassidy from Oregon State is actually presenting. So what a great opportunity for continuing education and really just to share in James uh, Cassidy's delightful delivery this Saturday. Again, we'll be saying more about that in a couple slides. Okay, um, looking for other announcements, you know, other, at, um, uh, other announcements from, uh, from folks in terms of um, activities coming on. And uh, Val? You're, 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 step, you're stepping up. Sorry, you want an announcement? <laughs> we're, we're working um, diligently on our only spring workshop. Wendy's at the, at the helm for that. And it will be a very informative and kind of a different format than most of us are used to. So we're all looking forward to jumping in and making that another big success for our uh, demo garden area. This will be held in the dog barn April 21st from one to three in the afternoon. And our work parties at the demo garden began last week. So we started with uh, mostly pruning in the hardy landscape area. And I must say, uh, the removal of that big Leland, I always want to say Leland Stanford, that uh, mm -hmm. that Leland Cedar um, has allowed our blueberries a brand new perspective on getting heat from the sun. So, and Debbie uh, Knight pruned those and they're already full of leaves. So I think we'll have a bumper crop there. And uh, we've got, uh, Cindy just announced, we sent over 228 seedlings to our food banks yesterday. So we're from zero to 60 in, um, you know, we're all on target and ready to get busy and waiting for it to warm up a little bit. And <laughs> so thank you. You want to put uh, and so April twenty first, you have that uh, the big event, but your work parties are all are underway, right? They're all on Thursdays this year, and 
our calendar seems to be working pretty well in the volunteer portal. So they're all, Vivian has all of those things listed on our volunteer calendar. So please take a few minutes and look at that because it's all very informative. And as is our, our uh, regional website, the state website is, has tons of information also. So just a plug for that. Okay, other announcements? I had a thought or something for, um, since I missed the study group last month, um, one newsletter that I don't know if it got mentioned was Seeds for Thought, which is the state newsletter. And I'll put a link to that in the chat as well, because it's on, um, it's actually online as a blog now. So you don't have to rely on the faulty email program to block your email. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Other announcements, okay, please. I, I want to talk a little bit. This is Elena. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll, I'll stop share, Elena, if you're ready, to, you're ready to share. Yes. Okay, I'm going to stop my share. You can start your share. Okay, I'm going to share this first one. And, of course, I can't tell... There we go. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, there was some uh, questions last week about uh, how do we use the the um, non-discrimination statements now that Tony is gone. And before she left, Tony and Tony <laughs> told Brenda and I that this is what you need to do. Um, it's it's in the handbook and hopefully the new handbook will be approved soon. But basically it says you must use one of the two examples listed below. And they're a little bit different, but they include the same information. So you have to use one of those two in any publication that you put out to the public, whether it's a um, flyer, whether it's a poster, I've already talked to, to Terry Small about this. And in addition to one of those two statements, you also have to include this third statement. Um, I know it's a lot of information, but that's what WSU wants now. And all we did is eliminate Tony's name and are just asking people to contact the County Extension Office or to call that number and Sue Carball will pick it up. So um, I think it's this way now in the um, current handbook, all you have to do is eliminate Tony's name and her email address. Okay, very good. And then the other thing I wanted to share was, and you've already talked about it, um, the new website that you just showed us a few minutes ago, um, I got it confirmed that, of course, the public can, can look at the website. But if you click on MGV, which is the portal, all Master Gardeners, interns, and trainees can access that page. And this weekend, we're going to be giving the password out to all the trainees at the four locations. So just to clear up any misunderstanding that's occurred in the past, everyone who is in the Master Gardener program in some way or other does have access to that portal. So are there any questions? Okay, that's all I have to say. Oh, and next month, in April, we're doing uh, vegetable gardening as part of training. And we're gonna have Jim Croft will be the speaker. And if you're interested in helping out in the class, um, contact either me or Sharon Coolish Bales in South Bend or Elizabeth in Montesano or Sushila in Ocean Shores to help out with the class. 
That's all I have to say. Okay. So if you'll stop your share. Yes. Um, let me go back here. Hold on. I'm going <laughs> to. Too many things are moving around here. Okay. Screen say as the shared window is closed. Okay. Very good. Very good. And so just talking about training and let's just, it's a good bridge then, right? So this Saturday, this Saturday is healthy soil science. And uh, Alina, Mike, Sushila, did, uh, anyone want to speak to the, the training class and the program for uh, this Saturday? It's just going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be playing in the dirt. <laughs> It actually is a. It, it does look like a very interesting program, and it uh, you know, and so it, again, it's all four sites, you know, at four locations, and at um, uh, soil science is this is a big deal. And again, I want to shout out for uh, James the James Cassidy presentation, which is just a, it's just always entertaining, and of course, incredibly at uh, incredibly uh, education uh, and educational. I'd like to ask a question. This is Elizabeth. Um, will James Cassidy be available via Zoom or anything to the, the, the larger population of Master Gardeners? And I'm, and I'm speaking to Sushila specifically and um, Elena. Do we know that? He will be on Zoom. I'm not sure how that will work for the, for the other Master Gardeners and the population. I would think that he that it would be available. I'm just not. Sh they would have to log into Zoom, and so that would have to be put out. Okay, so then we'll, we'll know by the end of the week, though. Yeah. Well, all we have to do, Elizabeth, really, is just push out the Zoom URL and meeting credentials to the membership and let yes, them I, know. I, yeah. I I I know Kelly, okay. and I, okay. and I and I know that that um. We really want the trainees to be the focus of the of the the talk and to be the people who ask the questions and the people who get the answers to the questions, if that makes sense. So all of us who are going to be listening to James Cassidy because good information and fascinating speaker are are kind of silent participants for the day. Mm -hmm. And that'd be easy for the host then to make sure that the uh, that others that uh, outside of the four sites, um, everyone else is muted. And so we can we can easily control that. Super. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on training? Terry, want to speak to a Home and Garden Show? You had a big article in the E News about it. Yes. Um, everything is um, happening uh, in terms of of vendors signing up, checks coming in. Um, we're working on the speaker schedule, which we are organizing um, a little bit differently this year. We're going to do um, uh, veggies plus, you know, some other topics on Saturday. And then we are striving to have a Sunday uh, flower power schedule. And uh, to, to that end, we have uh, Nancy Nesbitt from Rhodesia uh, flower garden who's going to speak on Sunday and she's also going to be on the garden tour in Pacific County mm -hmm. with her amazing um, flower cutting garden that she uses uh, uh, so it's it's I think going to be kind of a a fun way to to maybe push people into attending more of our uh fabulous talks and and we're going to be working hard on that about increasing attendance um, for these um, presentations at the home and garden show the garden tour is coming along um, we still need probably one more garden um, and uh, this is kind of normal we always seem to um, go up until the last minute in terms of, of finding a, a full schedule of gardens for a garden tour, but it is coming together. Um, so if you have any thoughts, any ideas, uh, of course, we'd love to hear them. Uh, Sharon Coolish Bales is, is leading the, the garden search and the tour um, in Pacific County. And uh, so 
Uh, you can talk to her. You can talk to me. You can talk to Rhonda. You can talk to Robin. Um, we are all ears for any any leads uh, for the garden tour. Robin, Rhonda, any extra thoughts? Well, I just wanted to say I feel like I'm down to the on the home stretch now with the garden with the home and garden show. It's only March and I'm I'm full. Like my my booths are all full. In fact, now I'm trying to make room along the back wall to add more. So it's really cool. Usually I'm in even into May, I'm still have, you know, a few openings. So it's crazy. And again, this speaks to how important this show is, right, to the economy, you know, overall, yeah. and that the, the importance of what uh, of what we as a foundation have developed in terms of building up that home and garden show. So, a reminder to everybody that yes, the show is on Saturday and Sunday, but the the you know the the pre work begins even on Thursday in terms of setup. So, it uh, you know, please um, you know consider making it, uh, as much time as possible available for that long weekend because it's a big deal, not just for the foundation, but obviously for the as as Robin's indicating, for the for the the, the scores of vendors that participate. Rhonda, you have your hand up. I would just add from the home side. I think I'm always panicking. It's sometimes so difficult to get people to commit by actually sending in the form and actually making payment. As of today, I have 11 booths remaining, but I have nine vendors who've committed to those, but I've not seen paperwork yet. So they, they kind of keep me on my toes. Um, we have lots of new vendors again, and the home side is increasingly becoming strictly home improvement. If you can think of any business in any of the locations that may need to spread the word about what they do, plumbers, electricians, carpenters, uh, reach out, give them to me and I'll contact them. I've got lots of emails and feelers out and now just waiting to fill in the last bit. It's going to be a great show again. Other announcements? This is also a reminder also that part of July, part of the plant garden tour is the plant sale. And it, um, this, is ab this is very much the time for us to be thinking about um, um, uh, propagating and at, uh, planting uh, plants that'll be robust and in full foliage come July 20th. So it's um, encouragement for everyone to think about um, uh, putting together as many plants as possible. I mean, this is a, uh, you, uh, we may think of it as an aside for the garden tour, but this brings in um, several thousand dollars for us. And people come to the garden tour ready to spend, ready to uh, purchase plants and ready to purchase plants that have been, been cultivated and nurtured by master gardeners. So it, uh, so you know, please it, uh, stay serious, uh, get serious and get, uh, let's get serious into it. Again, other announcements. Okay. So a reminder also to get our, our, our hours recorded. Uh, this is a, it's a clear reminder that this is an opportunity now, right, for us to be thinking about um, uh, 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 to, to make sure that, we, you know, we're, 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 we're beginning the new year here with good habits of getting the hours recorded, both for continuing education and for volunteers, our volunteer hours on a timely fashion so that we're not playing catch up come to, uh, come the end of the year. And of course, is that, um, as we've always said, if there's any problems or issues in using give polls, reach out either to Alina and now to Wendy, um, you know, if indeed there's a, a support or a help we need here. So we're gonna, uh, Bob's gonna be joining us here in a couple seconds here, but I wanted to, uh, to take note of Kathleen Schaefer's recommendation that we make sure that uh, people are aware that next month, is Washington Native Plant Society's Native Plant Appreciation Month. And there's a whole series of uh, webinars and activities that certainly would count for continuing education that begin right on April 1st. So it, uh, we gotta be thinking about all these activities that are that are indeed are, are playing up, uh, 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 that you have opportunities for continuing education. And of course, read your e-news for the whole list of opportunities for continuing education, okay? 
And I want to do a quick plug for the upcoming speakers that we have here on this general meeting. Muriel Nesbitt, coming from Clallam County, will be talking to about declining nutritional values of hybrid vegetables. Robin O'Quinn is coming, will come to us from Eastern Washington University. Um, I describe her as kind of the Doug Tallamy of the West in terms of her adamancy in terms of native plant restoration of um, of our of our of our uh, of our areas here in the western in the western part of the country and then finally in june wendy wheeler will be here she actually runs wsu's pesticide resources and education program so at, um, uh, that'll be very timely as we start getting into summertime and uh, all the public engagement that we have relative to what should i spray on my plants and so here's an opportunity here to um, learn um, directly from uh, Dr. Wheeler as to what, what, what resources, the numerous resources that are available. So I'll be talking about these, uh, these speakers coming up. But um, again, April, May, and June, some uh, pretty high class uh, talent will be coming to speak with us here. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to go back and it uh, and do a little uh, at, uh, you know a little vamping here before as, as Bob joins us at uh, before at uh, and Bob has indeed uh, joined us here a little bit here but I wanted to I wanted to um, uh, I wanted to do a quick intro um, and it uh, and of course I'll have to have Bob to talk about the uh, you know his 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 this picture here that he chose here that uh, <laughs> and that uh, to have his 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 his, uh, his his snow his snow peak background here um i guess this is where the this is where the storm water starts is up in the, <laughs> is up in the mountains in one sense here um but um, um my introduction to, to bob is i was fascinated by all of what um you know i've read about the uh, the you know the wsu stormwater the rural stormwater program and of course as we were just talking about um in terms of the weather uh, in terms of the, the annual precipitation that we have received here in our two county areas during this rain year, it is exceptional. So uh, to, we've all, you know, been dealing with a lot of uh, flooding and a lot of risk of flooding. And it, um, and given our 3,500 square mile uh, two county region, we've got a lot to be sharing here. So Bob, come, I'm, I'm going to stop the share and open it up to you for an introduction and, it, uh, and to take it away. All right. Well, thanks, Kelly. Really appreciate the invitation. And, uh, you know, uh, a decade ago, I was uh, director of the Mason County office, um, overseeing all the programs in the office. And uh, I so valued our Master Gardener program. Just incredible volunteers and just such a resource to our community there. Um, but they, we didn't have these really educational foundation meetings, which I think is really great idea. And now I, I moved up to Northern Puget Sound. I'm, I'm based out of our um, Fort Hadlock office up near uh, Port Townsend and uh, and work in Clallam, Jefferson and Kitsap counties primarily, but also around Puget Sound. All right. Um, so anyways, thanks to you all for being here. And uh, and I'm gonna talk about stormwater. I'm not gonna give you the magic uh, potion or whatever for making it rain less there. <laughs> Let's see, I'm gonna multitask here and share my screen. Okay. It is interesting, Bob, is we're waiting for that, is that how much less rain you get, how much less precipitation you get up there in Jefferson County than we do just um, just a few miles down to south here? Because I guess you get the rain shadow, of course, from the Olympics. Yeah, Jefferson County is, is really a mixed bag. Um, let's see. Are you, what are you seeing? Is there say Zoom there? We're seeing Zoom, yeah. That's not good. Stop that. Try that again. But we get about 19 to 20 inches a year in Port Townsend. Um, which, and, and compare that to 95 to 120 here in Pacific County. Yeah, but like down in Quilcene, 
So a half hour south, they get 55 inches. Mm -hmm. so Mason County, we were getting like 60 inches. So I, I'm pretty familiar with a lot of rainfall. Um, but like right here, here. Okay, okay I got to stop that again. It'll take me a minute. Okay, that's better. I'm not a very good multitasker. You're doing fine. This is looking good. Well, that's it. That's what I want to show you. All right. So, so yeah, I don't have all the answers. What we're going to talk about today is, um, you know, the educational materials we have about dealing with excessive rainfall and runoff. So some of our solutions, we, we talk about retaining and infiltrating or soaking that water into the ground. We also talk about just conveying the water and maybe trying to infiltrate it as it's being conveyed away. Because, you know, when it just keeps raining, you've got to move it somewhere where it won't flood your garage or your basement or, or, or what have you. So, um, and the idea in terms of conveying it away, you know, you want less harm to happen. You want less erosion. You don't want your gullies to get deeper and deeper. Um, you don't want sediment moving into the streams. And you don't want contaminants moving, you know, from roads and driveways into, into water bodies, you know, the bays and the streams. So, colleagues, mine, I put together a grant a couple of years ago, um, and then I pulled together a, a really incredible team, um, Anijara Karan. He's a stormwater specialist out of our Puyallup Research and Extension Center. Um, and he's also affiliated with the Washington Stormwater Center, which is also based out of Puyallup. Um, Erica Gutman, she's a real lead in terms of vegetation and um, bioretention strategies. And Darcy Mac McNamara, she was kind of our coordinator. Um, not really on the expertise side, except for very expert at uh, hurting us cats and uh, getting all this information uh, pulled together, all the scientific parts of it, and then put out there on the website. And, and same thing with Carly. She helped with some of the technical content, but also a lot with the website and, and organizational stuff. And then we also had an advisory committee of, of people working in stormwater management for area tribes, uh, nonprofits, um, some of the counties around here. So, so we decided to focus on rural stormwater um, because there's a lot of information out there about, you know, um, stormwater management in more developed areas and not really focused towards homeowners, more focused towards, uh, you know, public work staff and, and what have you. So, um, but we surveyed people, we surveyed practitioners working uh, in the region. So the stakeholders I'm talking about is people who work in say Jefferson County, the planning offices, what kind of, we, we wanna know what kind of questions they're getting so that with our limited resources with this grant, we could focus on developing the, the most needed educational resources. All right. So and a lot of these, you know, the caveats include um, a, a lot of information on, on that rely on infiltrating water into well-draining soils. And sometimes we just don't have those. So there's, you know, there's times that, you know, basically none of these strategies will work well except for channeling it away from where you don't want it. 
So here's a, a screenshot of website. Um, but you see on, on the left, yeah, the left side, uh, you know, the whole the whole menu. And then if you point to these, these arrows, if you click on it, you'll get the menu of, of the fact sheets that, that we've developed. So here, um, here are some of the fact sheets. Here are the, the fact sheets that, that we developed as part of that, as well as this white paper. They guess a bit more more technical detail, um, but it has actually a lot of the same graphics as those fact sheets. So if you really want to get into the weeds, um, the white paper is also a good resource. All right. So I thought I'd uh, show this kind of stormwater basics video. I have three videos that we produced as part of this. And I might uh, end this a bit early just to, just to save some time. And I'll, I'll, I'll probably show you the full, the next full versions of the other two. So hopefully it will work. And let me know, uh, Kelly, give me a hands up if you hear the town. Welcome to the first yep. video in the series, Rural Stormwater Solutions. This series is for rural landowners facing drainage challenges, such as ponding water in the driveway, unwanted water coursing through the yard, or ensuring water flows away from buildings and livestock areas. All of the information shared in this video series is detailed on the Rural Stormwater Solutions website at ruralstormwater.wsu.edu. You'll find fact sheets, videos, resources, and demonstration sites. This first video provides an overview of stormwater with a focus on the unique challenges facing rural landowners. If you live in a rainy area like the Pacific Northwest, you've probably heard about stormwater, rain or snow melt that runs off rooftops and down gutters and streets. It flows into storm drains and pipes to be carried away, eventually ending up in a nearby river, bay, or a larger water body such as Puget Sound. Stormwater is a problem because it can cause flooding and impact water quality. Water picks up everything in its path. That means stormwater can carry invisible pollutants like fertilizers, animal waste, pesticides, oil, bacteria, heavy metals, and other contaminants, even in water that looks clean. Toxins pollute the water and result in closed beaches and shellfish beds and can enter the food web where they can accumulate in the tissues of fish, seals, salmon, and whales. You might think of stormwater as a city problem. And in fact, most stormwater management efforts have focused on urban watersheds due to the high densities of people, pollutant sources, and impervious areas. But rural areas have stormwater management issues too. Stormwater runoff can damage rural properties and roadways, as well as pollute streams and other water bodies. Rural areas often have many high quality natural resources, such as clear, clean streams, wild salmon, healthy forests, open pastures, and abundant wildlife that can be harmed by poor stormwater management. Even though rural areas have fewer paved surfaces, fewer homes, and less traffic, they can still flood. Compacted gravel roads, buildings, and farm structures, even pastures are susceptible to runoff problems without the benefit of big city solutions, such as storm drains that convey water away to treatment facilities in some cases. Of particular concern for rural landowners, stormwater can also flood farm fields, polluting the crops and gardens of the people who live there. Flooding is exacerbated by our changing climate. Climate researchers predict an increase in the frequency and intensity of heavy rain events in western Washington, leading to an increase in winter stream flows. This can lead to more flooding in the future. When we alter the landscape, the movement of water and the amount of infiltration can be affected which can result in damage to property and the environment. Vegetation such as trees, shrubs, and grasses capture and slow rainfall, decreasing stormwater runoff. When land is cleared, 
Rain falls directly on the bare soil and flows across the land surface, which can cause erosion and flooding. Compacting soils by parking or driving on it, or by allowing livestock on it, reduces infiltration and creates more runoff. Creating driveways or roads alters the direction of flow and often impounds water up gradient or uphill of the work. Following the motto, we all live downstream, reminds us that changes in the landscape up gradient from your property may affect you as well as the properties and the ecosystems down gradient from you. Fortunately, there are many solutions to rural stormwater challenges. Many rural residents use swales, dispersion methods, rain gardens, and other techniques to manage and infiltrate water on their property. If your groundwater is high and stormwater can't infiltrate during the wet months, you may be able to safely convey water across your landscape with other techniques to a place where it can infiltrate. You can also use techniques to intercept water before it can become a problem, such as planting trees and other plants to slow it down. You may want to explore detaining water on your property, providing time for rainfall to filter back into the groundwater. If you don't have seasonally high groundwater, you can infiltrate the stormwater generated on your site back into the soil to filter and store it in groundwater aquifers. This will result in an increase in your water availability for the dry summer months and help maintain stream flows. Now that you're familiar with stormwater basics, check out the next video on how to make a site drainage map. This is a map that shows how water flows on your parcel of land. Making one is the first step. All right, so move on. We'll see that site map video. But I want to get back to the website for a bit. Um, and yeah, we created these videos because uh, they really contain a lot of information and it's conveyed so much better than I can convey it. Um, just jabbering away here. And, uh, and I could see, you know, on my little uh, participant screen, Rhonda and Val um, intently watching the video. So I, I really kind of appreciated uh, your focus. Um, and, uh, you know, I recognize that, that this is a good way to, to teach people because, you know, pictures worth a thousand words. So, anyways. Uh, you know, down here on the side, um, you know, you can click on different topics like stormwater basics. And when I click there, um, I get to yeah, no, actually, when I click on resources, I don't know why that slide is there. When I click on resources, this is what I get, and then I get um. So then I can look at general information about stormwater or more information about site planning, um, more information on bioretention spells. So, so all these options are here. And uh, so to demonstrate, uh, yeah, that's it. I had my slide that out of the out of order. So, anyways, um, if I clicked on stormwater general, I'd get to this page. And then I have you know that videos on there as well as our other video and then other resources about contaminants. And then down below, you can click down, there's, there's a whole bunch of these um, publications. Um, a lot of them done by other people, like this this web page from King County. So it's not just the resources that we've developed here, but it's resources that, that we found to be useful that others have, have put together. So that resources list is, is really great because yes, we have our stuff, but then we have other people's stuff that we felt were, was valuable. All right. And this is a topic actually it was our Jefferson County Master Gardener that that in talking with some of them and our coordinator, uh, Bridget Craig, they recommended that that we um, create materials around just building a, a basic site map for your property because that's when you really start to look at things and really start to think about drainage issues as well as other things. 
Um, but if you create a site map, then we can uh, know where the best spots might be to you know create drainage swales or ditches or rain gardens, but also where you might or might not want to put outbuildings um, and things you need to protect, like your uh, well pump house. Um, so anyway, we'll have the video talk more about that. There's my hot air. Welcome to the second part in the video series, Rural Stormwater Solutions. Here, you'll learn how to make a site drainage map for your property, so you'll better understand your land and how water moves across it. All of the information shared in this video series is detailed on the Rural Stormwater Solutions website at ruralstormwater.wsu.edu. You'll find fact sheets, videos, resources, and demonstrations. Once you understand that, you'll be able to better assess your drainage problems and issues on your site. Your map will help you understand how water flows onto your property and moves across it. Once you understand that, you'll be able to better assess your drainage problems and solutions available. If you plan to clear vegetation, add a building or reroute water, you'll have your site plan to refer to, ensuring your plans will not cause harm to your home, utilities, or the surrounding environment. Even a very basic drawing can be quite helpful and informative. You can get as detailed as you like, but generally a site drainage map shows the main features on your land, structures, and surrounding area, as well as how water flows on and across your land. The map will show property boundaries, structures, compacted areas like driveways and parking areas, wet areas, and utilities. You can even show planned future projects, such as a new shed or garden space. Before you get started on your map, it is useful to go online to view your property from a bird's eye view. Go to Google Maps or your county's parcel map and put in your address. Zoom in to see your property and the surrounding areas. Maps such as Google Earth and some county websites have measuring tools that are useful for accuracy. They may also have maps of soil type, topography, waterways, and other information useful for your map. You can print out the map, then use tracing paper over the printout for accuracy. Using an online aerial map, you may be able to tell where water is coming onto your property and its source, such as a nearby drainage ditch. It is also important to see where the water leaves your property and what is downstream from your land. You will find plenty of information on the Rural Stormwater Solutions website about other online tools and maps that can help you learn even more about the underlying features of your site, including soils, well logs, slopes, and nearby streams and wetlands. To get started, gather the equipment you'll need. 100 foot or more tape measure, a clipboard, graph paper, ruler, compass, and pencil and eraser. You'll also want to have a printout of your aerial map handy if you made one. Okay, let's make a site map. Grab your equipment and head out to your yard. First, decide what size scale to use. You might want to go bigger or smaller depending on how large your property is or how detailed you want your map to be. Draw the scale on your graph paper for easy reference. Next, get your compass and determine which way is north. Mark an N with an arrow in the direction of north on your map. With aerial maps, north is typically oriented at the top of the page. The next step is to draw the outline of your property. You can use your aerial map and measure online, or use your tape measure and get the dimensions. Mark everything on your map. Look for the land uses adjacent your property. Note neighboring houses, roads, forests, pastures, shoreline, and steep slopes, and any other features nearby. Does the area around you slope down to your property, or are you on a hill? You may not be able to see everything if you have lots of trees, and that's where your aerial map comes in handy. Now, let's look at the features of your property. Identify all of the existing structures on your property, such as your house, garage, pump house, and other outbuildings. Measure them all, and draw them on the map in relationship to each other. Now draw in driveways, garden areas, patios, and livestock areas. 
Be sure to note any compacted areas or hard surfaces. If you know where they are in your property, draw in buried utility lines such as phone, electric, water, sewer, or cable. Be sure to include buried lines to outbuildings and other locations on your property. If you have a septic tank, drain field, and well, draw them in also. Note natural features such as slopes, bluffs, streams, and wetlands, or waterfront on your land. Also mark the location of large trees and shrubs, as well as areas of natural vegetation. You may also want to draw in the building and property line setback distances that are required in your locality. Take a step back and look at your land overall. Note the gradients that exist on the land. How does it slope overall, as well as in different areas? Think about water sources. Where does water come onto your property? Where is it running off of your property? What are the current drainage patterns? After rain events, are there areas of standing water? Note all of these on your map. Where are any sensitive areas, such as wetlands, streams, or steep slopes? Note any current drainage problems to complete your map. Next, you'll want to determine the soil types on your property. Since most of the strategies available for solving drainage problems in rural areas rely on infiltrating water into well-draining soils. You can get a general sense of your soils from the Natural Resources Conservation Service, county soil maps, and your local conservation district. To get site-specific accuracy, you'll want to dig and compare your soils to what the online resources show. You will also need to assess drainage ability by conducting a simple percolation test. The Rain Garden Handbook for Western Washington has easy to follow directions. You'll find it and a helpful video on the Rural Stormwater website. Your map is done. Hopefully you now have a better understanding of the sources of your drainage challenges and your site constraints. You can pursue the best options for solving the problems and ensure your future plans don't cause problems. Keep in mind that any activity on your land can change the flow of water across it. If you plan to alter your land by building a structure or adding a new driveway or patio, use your map to consider locations that will not cause drainage problems or harm waterways. Even clearing vegetation or compacting soils by parking in a new area changes the way water flows on your property. Altering the water flow can have unintended consequences, such as new puddles and ponding areas, flooded basements, washed out roads, and loss of salmon habitat. To learn more, please visit the Rural Stormwater Solutions website at ruralstormwater.wsu. All right. Well, that excellent uh, lesson there was Darcy. Project coordinator and a star in our video. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was great. I don't think we got nominated for an Oscar. <laughs> I'm sure we're pretty close. Anyways, yeah, th I worked with the WSU. Um, we have some video staff at WSU, and, and I use their services for this. And they, they were so fun to work with, and um, I think they did a great job. Um, so that's the video about creating a site map, but we do have communication um, about creating a site map that goes kind of into more detail. So there that is. We'll click on that and get that um, six page long publication. And then uh, unfortunately we don't we only had the Puget Sound counties, kind of because that's our, where our grant was focused. And uh, so we don't have Grays Harbor or Pacific counties, unfortunately. But I'm going to show you what, what's on the Clallam site. And um, you can find swim, summer information from your county's websites, whether it's Pacific or Grays Harbor, I'm, I'm sure. Um, every county environmental health department um, seems to have a lot of information about septic systems um, and about the resources that they have. There's also in each of the counties um, anymore has the GIS parcel maps that you can 
click on to get your uh, property identified. All right. And then there is some other site planning resources that, that we've gathered. Um, so when you click on that, you'll see the other resources uh, for soils, for video demos on, on looking at soil texture. Um, yeah. And so the last video is about the different options for managing stormwater. So a lot of, uh, some of them have been mentioned here, but this goes a bit more. This is the third video in the series, Rural Stormwater Solutions. In this video, we will look at some solutions available to help solve drainage issues, including removing standing water in your yard, preventing erosion, dealing with minor flooding, and redirecting water from your building foundation. In addition to preventing property damage, you'll be protecting groundwater and water quality in nearby lakes, streams, and marine waters. Determining which solution is most appropriate to manage stormwater on your land may require consultation with an expert or knowledge gained through attending some basic training offered by the local county, extension, or conservation district. Remember, altering the flow of water can also have unintended consequences. Many of the solutions offered involve infiltrating water, which requires well-draining soils. You may need to direct water to where you have good infiltration and then allow it to soak into the ground. Let's start by talking about solutions that capture and infiltrate rainwater. Rain gardens, bioretention systems, and gravel-based systems. These options reduce flooding and erosion and remove harmful contaminants from stormwater. They are designed with flat bottom areas to allow for uniform infiltration. A rain garden is a shallow, flat bottom, bowl-shaped landscape feature designed to collect, filter, and infiltrate stormwater runoff from roofs and pavements. You can build one yourself with a basic level of training. A bioretention system is similar to a rain garden, but is an engineered system using a specified bioretention soil mix and often sized to accommodate large volumes of stormwater runoff, often in commercial areas. Gravel-based systems are stone-filled excavations situated over well-draining soil that uses the empty spaces between the stones to act as a temporary reservoir for stormwater as it soaks into the surrounding soil. They can be open at the surface or buried. French drains, dry wells, and curtain drains are all types of gravel-based systems. Now let's talk about moving water around on your property. If you have standing water on your property, you may want to route it to another location. Moving water is a serious undertaking and should be considered carefully to ensure you're not causing further problems. To select the option that is right for you, you'll want to consider the volume of water you want to move and how quickly it's moving, along with the types of contaminants that might be in it. You will also want to understand where the water will go and how it will impact neighboring land uses. A site drainage map will help with this. Moving water across the land can be accomplished by a simple drainage ditch, an open channel that moves water quickly from one place to another. This method provides little to no water quality treatment, but it can be used to move water to or from an area where treatment occurs. A bioinfiltration swale swale is specifically engineered to convey stormwater and remove pollutants. Water moves along the swale more slowly than a conventional drainage ditch, allowing water to be slowed by the plants and infiltrate into compost amended soils below, removing sediment and other contaminants. Next, we're going to talk about dispersing water. If you have a large vegetated lot, you may want to explore surface dispersion systems to slow and process stormwater. Dispersion methods include downspout dispersion, sheet flow, and concentrated flow dispersion. In these systems, stormwater is forced to flow as a sheet, referred to as sheet flow, across the surface and dispersed by the vegetation and topography. The combination of spreading out the flow and slowing it down enhances infiltration into the ground. All surface dispersion systems have a specific design requirement, 
but I'll have the following three components. Contributing areas, where the stormwater comes from, such as a driveway or roof. A flow path, the route water takes as it flows from the contributing area to the dispersion area. The dispersion area, the area where the stormwater will be directed to for infiltration. Forested or heavily vegetated landscapes with soils that have not been compacted by vehicles or heavy equipment are often well suited to slow and infiltrate stormwater runoff. Our last topic is how to manage water in areas with truck, car, pedestrian, or livestock traffic. These areas provide unique challenges due to the continual compaction. Solutions include permeable pavers, gravel grids, and special asphalt or concrete systems that allow water to percolate through them. These help manage polluted stormwater by filtering, slowing, and infiltrating stormwater as it flows across hard surfaces like parking lots and driveways. Permeable pavements have an upper wearing layer that is rigid enough to support vehicles and permeable enough to allow water to pass through the pores in the layer. The layer is commonly made with grids, pavers, pervious concrete, or porous asphalt. Below the wearing layer are base layers of different sizes of aggregate, with pore spaces where the water infiltrating from the surface is temporarily stored. Over time, the water in the storage layers slowly infiltrates into the native soils and back to the groundwater aquifers. These special pavements have specific maintenance needs, and all of them should be maintained at least annually by suction and sweeping to keep the pore spaces from clogging with sediment and debris. We've covered a number of options to solve your stormwater challenges, and we hope one will work for you. For all of these methods, proper design and construction are essential, and long-term maintenance is needed. Learn more at the Rural Stormwater Solutions website, ruralstormwater.wsu.edu. You'll find a fact sheet on these options along with tables comparing them. If you haven't already, you may want to create a site drainage map to better understand your runoff challenges. See the fact sheet and view the video to learn how. But yeah, lots of information I'm throwing at you here. And I think the videos do a, a much better job than I can do. We should yeah. have ordered we should have ordered popcorn for this morning, Bob. I know, really. Yeah. But you know, that's another thing about extension. We, you know, we try to reach people based on their learning styles. And uh not everybody's great with uh printed paper, you know. Some people like websites and being able to click, 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 click. And some people like videos. And so this is really kind of a multifaceted approach that, that we took to look at different learning styles. So for options, um, so we talked about some of those in the video. Um, and so there under managing water, there's more information about each of these. Uh, retaining water on the site, conveying it, dispersing it. Um, so there's more information about each of those topics there. So like for retaining water, the, the options, typical options are rain gardens, uh, bioretention systems, which are just really fancier rain gardens, gravel trenches, and dry wells. But, and then in that fact sheet, we do have a comparison of detention options, which um, kind of compare, you know, here uh, the bioretention system versus the rain garden versus the gravel trench or drywall. And looking at a number of, of factors, um, such as water quality and, and quantity benefits. And, you know, another topic is bioinfiltration swell resources which, you know, in areas of heavy rainfall, I, I really emphasize that 
these are good options. And, it, you know, they're kind of like um, long, narrow rain gardens where um, you have, but you have water moving across the landscape. So, but as it moves, you put in, you have soils in the, the base of those that um, help store and infiltrate water through the lower layers and also help clean up that water. So the special bioretention soils really are just a mix of 60% um, sand and 40% compost. So the sand helps allow water to, to move into the soils and the compost actually helps treat the water, remove the contaminants. So bioretention soils is really a fancy name, um, but they're very useful. And they're even known to um, greatly reduce the, the amount of uh, tire wear particle contaminants. I don't know if many of you heard about this, this tire wear issue where there is um, chemical component in tires, 6PPD quinone, that they put into rubber, rubber formulations of the tires to help preserve the tires. But they're also that that particular chemical is essentially very harmful to, to some species of salmon, um, especially Chinook and coho. Not so much chum, but 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 that's kind of they're the canaries in the coal mine. There's there's other things in the ecosystem that also could be harmed. So um, anyways, those bioretention soils help take out that contaminant. And, and we all know because we all have to buy tires, uh, you know, regularly that our tires are wearing out and that tire wear is going somewhere. And that's in the streams. So we have a whole publication on just on the bioretention, bioinfiltration swales. So again, they convey water, but also help move water along on its on its flow path. And uh, before I do Q and A, I wanted to also point out we have some demonstration sites that we have documented information on. So that's also on the website. Um, we put in a rain garden. We designed and put in a gravel trench. So there's lots of pictures and lots of more detailed information about those things that we did um, on that page. And, you can also come on up here and see them. There, one's over in Clallam County, uh, two are in Clallam County, and one's over in Kitsap County. But this is something, and maybe I can send a, a, a bunch of these to Kelly to to get out there. Mm -hmm. it, um, this is just a business card, and so on the top right there is a little picture of just that. That's the size of that is a business card. And so we have these little plastic business card folders and it'd be great if you could put them at your like planning department desk or if you have an event, such as the garden tour or something where you have a table, you can put these cards out and then it, it directs people to go to the website. So that's the front of it and that's the back of it. And, uh, and so that steers people to the website instead of you telling them and, and giving them the address uh, verbally, you can just hand them a card. So anyways, I, if Kelly would give me his address and we can do that offline uh, via email, I can send a whole bunch of these to you because it would be great to get more of this information out to where it can be used. All right. So I want to reach out directly to Aaron and to Val who are on the call here today because Val of course has been that uh, you know a rain garden that she built last year has was featured as part of a garden tour a recent garden tour and then she and Aaron both talked about this as part of, in a very recent podcast um, but I'm curious so Val and Aaron from what Bob has shared here today any new insights or any perspectives in terms of um how we have, how you have approached, right? You know, this uh, 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 stormwater management. 
Hi, Bob. I'm I'm Valerie Savisky, and I was originally certified as a master gardener in Kitsap County. And as, to the extent of my my knowledge, I'm the only person in our counties down here who has a rain garden training certificate, which comes directly from the rain garden handbook or the handbook for uh, for Western Washington. Um, so I'm a very strong advocate uh, of rain gardens or bioswales. I happen to be in Alma, which is a teensy weensy town surrounded by immense rural um, areas of farmland and many, many streams and rivers that run through. So I I think the Greater Grace Harbor Conservation District, well, I'm, I know they're working with the Department of Fisheries now in our area to help the water flow for salmon uh, and other fish and just water flow. But I'm wondering if they have, if you know, if they have any specific information on the information that you've given us today, because I really would like to get together and talk to them if they could uh, help us create a program here that speaks to all this, although you've given us tremendous information. Um, so yes and no. Uh, so I, I don't know what they, of this information they pulled into their programs there. Um, but I could reach out and, and send them these links. And we did that way back uh, almost two years ago when this project uh, was completed. We reached out to all the conservation districts and said, hey, here's a great resource. Please put it as a link on your website. And uh, But I don't know what's really happened out there in, in all the different counties. So, I was I was just at the Thurston County Native Plant Sale, and one of the people from the extension from the uh, conservation district recognized me from last fall when I went to their fall plant sale, and I was talking to them about soil health and soil testing, and they had a huge display there for rain gardens. So I talked to them a lot about that too. Um, I I would only hope that some of their knowledge would trickle down, so to speak, to us in Grace Harbor, because they're they're really on it. And I, you know, the cool thing about uh, rain gardens is anybody can build one. And I specifically use native plants to create a better environment. Um, but anyway, I'm all about rain gardens. So thank you very much for your information. Oh yeah, yeah no, no problem. We also have, speaking of rain gardens, we just made it available for free um, on, web, on our website, on our rain garden website. Okay, I'm trying to get to it here. So I'll, I'll share the screen. Okay. One second here. Okay, so that's our, our rain garden specific website. So you can get to this on um, the rural stormwater solution. So it's like cross pollinate everything. But on this website, we do have this link um, to. Okay. We have a, yeah, here we go. No, you don't have it there yet. Yeah. It'll be there soon. So we have a four module program. And each 
And actually, there's like actually little quizzes along the way. Yeah, that's that's the program that I took, and Aaron has uh, put that on our ring. Well, I'll let Aaron talk, but but I plugged that uh, plugged that site to all of our master gardeners here in Grace Harbor County. So hopefully, some of them have visited it. And also plug the certification program. Maybe this is it. Yeah. Um, so that's not it. But anyways, um, that'll be there soon. Um, we were doing some. We had it on there. I know we did on the rain garden website but now we're doing this uh web page migration with wsu and it's like things got mixed up there so but bob following up on this do you reckon are we are we doing enough rain gardens here in western washington i mean just in general i mean or are there other mitigation activities that you would recommend um um uh, uh more significantly um, so rain gardens are a great solution. You know, they do require some maintenance, weeding, et cetera, but so does any garden. Um, but, and their function really is to, uh, they really do a good job of cleaning up the water. So they, they retain it and hold it there. And they, their job really is to, to soak it into the ground. But of course, if it keeps raining, then it's gonna keep on running running out overflow from the rain garden and keep going down. But it does give the water some time to for the sediment to, to settle out. And it also, most importantly, captures, they capture the first runoff flow when it first starts raining. That's when most of your contaminants are on the roadway or your driveway or, or, or wherever that water source is. So, so it's picking up and soaking into the ground uh the worst contaminants and as they soak into the ground the that bioretention soil that's kind of in the bottom of the rain garden is cleaning up the contaminants so so they they hold on to the water they soak into the ground they clean it up but when they do overflow at least that water is cleaner because it's settled out a bit and it's not the first pulse of rainfall that went in and soaked in initially so and if we had more of those we definitely have less of the 6 ppd uh tire wear particle getting into our waterways and uh and other contaminants you know heavy metals and believe it or not there's a lot of heavy metals that get on roadways from brake pads and and zinc plated fences and car parts so um but yeah, more rain gardens would be great. Um, and you know, just a key point is we, you know, we don't build rain gardens in areas that are already flooded. We really want to intercept the water before they get to the lowest areas and soak it in the ground, up gradient, um, because the low areas they're already getting flooded. And so, so we we lessen the flooding by capturing them kind of a little bit up gradient and soaking it into the ground. And reducing the puddles and the flooding a bit downgrading it. So, Bob, I put into the chat, you know, of uh, the uh, Snohomish counties um, a link to their rainscaping guide, which I was very impressed with um, how accessible it was and how professionally it was prepared from Snohomish County. I've also, uh, I noticed that um, uh, Missouri Botanical Garden has a whole rainscaping guide of resources that they put in there. Um, are there unique issues that we're dealing with here in rural western washington that we probably aren't going to find in what snohomish county is proposed or uh missouri yeah i don't know about missouri i mean of course their plant recommendations are different and what i've noticed uh a lot of there's a lot of you know, like minnesota and missouri and um actually maryland they've got lots of rain garden recommendations and they often don't 
have as much of the bioretention soil mix. And, and I think that's pretty vital because it's, you know, it's has a lot of pore space. So it stores a lot of water and it slowly infiltrates that. So, so the deeper the rain garden with more bioretention soil mix that's put back in, really can hold more water and, and are, do a better job at removing the contaminants. Um, and those guys also, you know, don't have, pro probably don't have, you know, the landscape plant recommendations that we have here. Um, and we've just updated our our publication, the Rain Garden Handbook. Oh. So um, I'll dig up, you know, I, I was looking the other day and I couldn't find the link, um, but I'll, I'll track that down and, and get it over to Kelly to, to send out. The link is not easy to find. Okay, do you have it? Maybe you can send it to me. It, it, it is on our, uh, uh, state foundation website via air and put it there um, with my rain garden blog that we recorded. Okay, so it is on the foundation website, the, the new handbook. You have to go to to the uh, green green thumb. I don't see Erin on the call. I think she's gone. But uh, it's if you go to the evergreen thumb on the state foundation website. You and and click on episode fifteen. You'll see all the resources there that I've used and that Aaron compiled for stormwater uh, mitigation. So, okay. Well, great. I, yeah, because I need to get those linked. Those new the new guide that just came out linked to both the Rain Garden website and the, the stormwater website. So, well, I don't have the new one. This goes th via the Department of Ecology, which oh, is a, that's the older one. We just roundabout way to get the WSU extension. Yeah, we just got done revising it like a few months ago, and updating it. Is it so the um, I, I I put the link I I is is the link that I put in the chat the current one? Yeah. I mean, we didn't. Nothing was change drastically like we're not saying oh don't do this anymore okay. that's the website i don't believe we have the, the new publication on here i don't think that url gets us to the handbook kelly yeah Anyways, I'll get I'll get that on there. So. That would be good. Other questions? Other questions for Bob? This is where it should be, but this is the old one. It may take some time, but anyways, um, I, I'm pretty sure that's the old one. So any any other questions? Yeah, that's that's Kevin. So, so there's a tremendous amount of resources, Bob. That's you made that very clear that are available that are available here. Are there if there's like some practical recommendations, just one, two, three that you think are you know as we engage with the public, and of course is that uh, as we go through these um these uh these these rain events that we've been experiencing here, I mean are there um are, are there are there a handful of key recommendations? that um, you think we should just have, uh, just be well prompted to share? Yeah, it, so first off, I mean, rain gardens, people think, oh, I'm gonna do this great thing for the environment and put a rain garden in. Well, maybe they don't really need one, you know, so that's the first thing is um, if they're, if you don't have water running off your property and causing a problem, if it is soaking to the ground somewhere on your property and you don't mind that it's running into the, the ground there, then maybe they can do something else with their time and energy, like putting in a, in a blueberry garden or, or, or vegetable crop or flowers or something, something else. So, so there's that, is, is there a problem? And then, and then, so, okay, we have water where we don't want it. Um, so it's, it's coming, you know, off our roof down 
down the, you know, through the gutters, down, down the drain pipe, and causing puddling along my foundation. Well, so there's strategies to, to, you know, channel that away and infiltrate it into the ground, maybe using, uh, you know, bioinfiltration swale, where it soaks into the ground as it's flowing towards the edge of your property. So it actually never makes it to the edge of your property. Um, so, so yeah, we just really have to think about, uh, and, and then, okay, so maybe um, you don't really, you have a, a lot of water and you don't, you're not able to um, soak it all in the ground as it's being conveyed. So maybe then you wanna put a rain garden in to help store some of that water and soak it into the ground. Um, and then if, of course, if it keeps raining, it would overflow to where it's probably always gone. But it's a matter of really in terms of uh, our households um, dealing with the runoff off of our roofs, paved areas, um, so that the water is moving away from these structures and not causing puddling or problems around foundations. And uh, but moving it in a way that it slows it down, and so that prevents the erosion and, and gullies from happening. Um, and it also provides opportunity, of course, for the water to soak into the ground. And uh, and it also lessens the ability of that water to to make to move contaminants from the driveway into a waterway. So slow it down. Try to infiltrate it and infiltrate in areas not near your foundation. So there's a, a big part of what you're getting at is that just be aware and be aware of where the water's flowing, be aware of the importance of controlling this runoff, right? You know, and given the, um, um, given the, um, the, uh, the impact, the contaminant impact. Um, by the way, we're very sensitive to that contaminant impact here in the peninsula, in the Long Beach Peninsula here, because all of our water, all the water we use and we drink, comes from the sky, right? There's no fresh water that flows into our peninsula. So everything we drink, everything we use, everything we excrete goes into the aquifer. So the idea of, of, uh, of, um, of, of uh, filtering that water is not just a science project or a conceivable, you know, it's, it's imperative for our health here. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, yeah, what we're drinking is what's soaking into the ground. And, uh, and again, the bioretention soils do a really good job of cleaning it up. And there's actually a lot of active research looking at what can we add to those bioretention soils, like biochar and uh, yeah, alum, other other elements we can add to take out more contaminants. But other questions, comments for Bob. So Bob, we've got to get you at uh, we got to get you some grant money here so you can focus on Grays Harbor and Pacific counties. You're you're so close, right? And I I, I think you're getting off light with only 50, 60 inches of rain, you know, per year, precipitation per year, right? You know, I mean that you you need a you need a real challenge. <laughs> I mean the the business inhabited areas of Fallon County, you know, Port Angeles gets about thirty five inches, Swim gets fifteen inches, we get twenty down a quilting and you know they get 55 inches and, and over in Kitsap they get around 40. So we have it light compared to you guys. But a key thing I'm noticing is that as development imp, uh, impacts uh, increases here, we're seeing a lot more land cleared, not just for timbering, but also for development. And so there's a lot more exposed land that is not doing well relative to handling all the precipitation that's coming down. So um, I believe we're seeing more, far more runoff um, um, regionally than it, uh, we had just a few years ago. Yeah, I would, that's definitely a big thing that people don't recognize. And they clear, you know, the woods behind their house that, that's upgrading it, that they're going to get a lot more runoff off of that cleared area than, than they would if it were forested. You know, a, a lot of storage and slowing down happens with all that vegetation. And the multi-layered vegetation is especially important. You know, pasture does not retain the water that a forest does. 
I think that's a key point to emphasize, right? You know, is that the forested area and the layers of canopy that you've just described, right, do a tremendous job of slowing down the precipitation coming down and the amount. Other questions, other questions, comments for Bob. Okay. Bob, I want to thank you very much for coming out uh, today. Uh, this is that. Uh, this is indeed it's significant. Uh, you you're coming across here to uh, to share with us here. Oh sure, sure yeah, it's a pleasure. I'm I'm always eager to talk to willing audiences, <laughs> interested audiences. Um, so I'm I'm glad. I, I hope these resources are useful to you and the people that you're working with. Mike, you have your hand up. I had a. Yep, I had a question for Bob. I I had a question for Bob. I see that on an OSU extension, they talk about Hugel culture as a sustainable stormwater management practice. And I didn't hear you mention anything about it, about the Hugel culture. Uh, just some thoughts on it. Um, it is a great strategy. So it really does allow for better infiltration and water holding capacity. I mean, they're typically built more like firms and so they're not i mean if you're able to get water on top of them and that's great um so we don't really emphasize them because um they're usually you know in a in a above the landscape kind of format but but i would recommend that if if you have one down gradient that that you can uh direct water to it and have it flow across and into it. I think that would be a fantastic strategy. Um, there's probably other great creative ideas out there that, that you know, that are not addressed in these materials and, and that I haven't thought of and my colleagues either. But, and so I, I don't think we've really put a lot of thought into to recommending Cuba cultures, even though that's a, a good, could be a good option. Final questions, final comments for Bob. Bob, if you want to stop your share, I want to I want to show one more one more slide here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> forgot about that. And then it. Uh, All right. Very good. I want to thank Bob very much. And by the way, Bob, and it uh, and your your entire team there, and it. Um, and again, uh, credit for the uh, uh, very, very professionally done videos. So I, I appreciate the fact that you know you're you're reaching out to folks in a um, in a in a different way as opposed to uh, very dry, uh, dry info. And I'll definitely give you the uh, my contact information so you can send materials. We'd also perhaps uh, um, I think we'd like to reach out and consider that if you want to join us at the Home and Garden Show and it um, talk at, uh, and actually have a little booth or a little at, um, a table to share some of this information for the thousands of folks that'll be coming by. <laughs> at that uh you know that in may yeah i'm pretty booked i my i just had a coordinator leave her position and so i'm like slammed with a lot of uh extra other work <laughs> that i hadn't anticipated in the next two months until we get a new person there that's okay we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna pile down on you you know at uh we, ex we ex you know we you know uh, we, we we know that you and uh, wc extension have it uh, enormous broad shoulders right for capacity for to, so <laughs> anyway thanks for that and uh i'll get you those business cards and and i'm also you know email me with questions i'm happy to, to answer anything from today's presentation or any just things like how about who who culture um, I, I'm always open to, to learning and uh, helping you figure things out. So Bob's contact information is on the screen now. Don't hesitate to reach out. He gets lonely up there in Port Hadlock, you know, and, it, uh, and we definitely can re, uh, to regale him with tales of our, of our precipitation. <laughs> well, take care. And then just a final recommendation before we cut uh, kind of off here is that uh, the next three months of uh, speakers are uh, very significant here, Muriel Nesbitt, Robin O'Quinn, and Wendy Sue uh, Wheeler. And it, uh, so very pertinent topics coming up in the next few months that are going to uh, help us and assist us in our outreach to the public. 
Okay, so if nothing else, then for the good of the order, we we at uh, let's get ready for our Saturday show with the uh, trainees for 2024, and it uh, and proceed ahead into uh, into March. Welcome to spring. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.